Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we come to Lesson 6 of the Psycheana Lessons by Dr. Frank B. Robinson. You do not need to go through these lessons in order. Each one carries its own individual truth. It is powerful if you follow them in order because there are certain exercises that build upon themselves, but there is no need for you to follow them in order. I've gotten many messages and emails about this and it is very powerful. One of the questions I've had is he hasn't really defined the law yet and he is coming at it from multiple perspectives to fully describe the law and it is very thorough. Each lesson unfolds a new truth about the law that he is discussing. And today we go to lesson six. Previously we've covered a lot of territory creation of the heavens, the vast infinite cosmos. Today we talk about truth and how it changes over time. Dear friend and fellow student, it was the commonly accepted fact amongst the ancient thinkers and philosophers that everything in existence had been developed from a beginning, which was quite primitive. Through all their writings we find this thought prominent. St. Augustine, one of the greatest of all church fathers, held this same view. And as a matter of fact, this view is now known to be scientifically correct. There is no question about it at all now. But sad to relate, this world went through a period of night. The blackest kind of night. It was black spiritually. It was black mentally. It was black intellectually. For religious superstition reigned supreme. And whenever and wherever religious superstition reigns supreme, then you may depend upon it. It is a period of black night in such periods, and there have been many of them. Thank heaven, reason and science are completely buried. Nothing matters except the black pall of religious superstition covering that period. This is what we called the Dark Ages, and truly dark they were, in the name of God. Those under the spell of religious superstition cruelly tore the limb from the body. They applied the torch to the homosexual. They gouged eyes out. They slit tongues. They used the thumb screw. They threw little babies up in the air and caught them coming down on the cruel prongs of a pitchfork. Nothing mattered to those who cherished their insane belief in a superstitious God. And those same religionists throughout the Dark Ages stopped at nothing in an attempt to foist their ungodly superstition on others. In such times the earth was flat. It had four corners. There was water in the heavens, and when it rained, God was opening the windows of these heavens to let a little moisture down to the earth. The stars were lights suspended in the firmament, and the sun was the big light while the moon was the little light, and both were suspended in the sky, hung there by God to give light to the earth. And for one thousand ghastly years, this condition existed right here on this old globe as we know it. It hasn't all gone yet by any means, but it's going, and going fast too. But it cannot go too fast, no matter how fast it disappears. But as I say, a remnant remains and it is part of my other work outside of this course to hasten the last remnant of such pagan superstition on its way to its inevitable doom. And I am happy in that work, of course. The thousand years came to a close, however, and with the passing of this dark age nightmare, men of reason began to appear on the horizon again. Many of them were brutally murdered by these religious superstitionists. But the fires of reason kindled by these men were fanned into one great flame of reason and intelligence, which has never been put out and which never will be put out. Came first the Brunos, they were burnt alive at the stake, then came the Keplers and the Galileos and the Copernicuses and many others. Sweeping the sky with his little telescope, Galileo and Copernicus both had moral courage enough to state that the sky was not flat. They said that the stars were not suspended in the sky but were other suns, probably giving light to other worlds. You know what they suffered for making such statements. Regardless of whether their theories were true or not, they did not jibe with the teachings of those in power during this thousand years of religious blackness. And so the originators of these theories, now proven facts, were either tortured or brutally murdered. 
However, one may bury truth to the earth. One may crush it, but sooner or later, grandly triumphant, it will rise from the earth and shine once more. It may be buried for such periods as this ghastly 1,000 years, but some time or other, it will rise again in spite of all the religious superstition in the world. And that is exactly what it did. It took over a thousand years to resurrect it and rescue it from the holy lands of the religious superstitionist. But it was rescued, it was resurrected, and today it is here with us, glorious in itself. Religious superstition stands aghast at its revelations. Religious superstition wonders where the end will be, and it sees this truth which is sweeping the world its own end. And it cannot come too soon for the welfare of every created thing. For mark me well, please, the day is here when people will not accept religious superstition, no matter what man or what organization gives it to them. They don't want it, and they won't have it. And all over the civilized world today, even as I write this, almost every country that has been in the grip of religious superstition is throwing it away. That is significant, very significant. It has taken them a long time to wake up, but they are awake for sure and for good. This means much to the intellectual, mental, and spiritual future of such nations. For the moment the black and terrible pall of religious superstition is ended, then can these nations see the marvelous, stunning facts behind this mighty scheme of life. And truly marvelous facts they are, far too marvelous to be buried under the shroud of any system of religious superstition, where they have been buried for so long now. What a joy comes to me when I think of my part in the disseminating of these new and mighty truths of God. What a happiness fills my soul. What an intense love for all is manifested and how very careful I am in my efforts to tell you of the existence of this mighty, dynamic God law, hitherto unknown and unsuspected by the differing religious organizations in existence today. And you should be happy. Also, my friend, that you are, for the first time, being given the truths of the mighty creative God law as they exist. For the one who uses this mighty law knows, and he knows full well, that a proper application of the spiritual God law to his own conditions and circumstances will very effectively make such circumstances what he or she desires. So get ready, my friend. Don't think for one moment that I am fooling you. I have neither the time nor the inclination to do that, the very vastness and greatness of the God law. Though it makes me very overly enthusiastic to tell you about it, so that you may begin to put it into operation in your own life, and by so doing, obtain the things from God that you need so badly, some of you. I wish it were possible to unfold these mighty truths all at once, but that is not possible. I don't care what your mentality is, nor do I care what your education along spiritual lines has been. The truths I shall give you are so revolutionary that you absolutely cannot grasp them in one reading, nor could you grasp them all at once. I have tried it, and I know. And in the case which I have tried it, the truth I have been trying to teach has been invariably missed. So step by step, along the way, let me lead you. Let me take your hand and walk slowly into this great God realm, for to make haste might be perilous to your future. You might miss the goal. You might not find the God law. I know better than you do what is the best way to make known this startling revelation of God. I think so all I ask, ask you to do is to play the game fair and square do as I ask you to do, and follow me very closely, for remember, we are dealing with spiritual things. We are dealing with spiritual law, and spiritual things are always unseen things. Remember that. Now, to get back again to where I left off, out of the black night of the dark ages came the torchbearers of truth. They did not believe in this religious superstition vaunting itself on the earth those days and masquerading as an agent of God. They saw further than that. They saw beyond the black night. They saw beyond the superstition. They suspected that God did not lie in the teachings of these religious superstitionists who were holding the world in mental and intellectual and spiritual blackness and night. They suspected that God was far removed from such teachings. 
they saw the cruel flames sear and destroy the bodies of those who would not believe the stories told by these superstitionists, and they used their reason. They wondered what sort of a god it could be who produced such a murdering mob of followers. They wanted nothing to do with such a god, and they frankly said so. Lamarck came to France and Kant to Germany. Spinoza appeared in Holland and Locke in England. They disputed, they thought. And they sowed the seed and made the first move in the removing of the terrible black robe of religious superstition which had so effectively buried the truth for over a thousand years. Then came Darwin, who gave to the world his origin of species, and on this work was founded evolution, which today is being taught in almost every university in Christendom. The religious superstitionists fought this teaching as bitterly as they knew how to fight it. But to no avail, truth triumphed. It raised its head again, and today the fact of evolution is as firmly established as is the fact of gravitation. Only the remnant, which remains of the religious superstitionists, do not believe it. It is universally accepted by the intellectual class the wide world over. It was accepted as truth when it was first given to the world, and in 73 years it is known to be the truth, but hundreds of thousands perished during the thousand years of dark ages because they would not accept the teachings of religious superstition, but those teachings were all wrong, as is now well known. The superstition has told us very solemnly and very fearfully that their God created the whole universe at once and in six days. They told us the stories I have once referred to in this lesson about the lights being suspended in the sky by God, and their God that is. They told us of the creation of man. They said that this God of theirs, after making the entire creation in six literal days, spit in the ground, made a man, caused a deep sleep to come on the man, opened up his side, and took a rib out and made a woman, the first woman from this rib. This is what those who were in authority during the dark ages and before told us. They knew nothing of natural law. They knew nothing of science. They knew nothing of evolution, for the religious superstitionists were in full control. They killed at once, and very brutally too, every soul who would dare doubt their teachings. The auto de fe was in vogue in the day and age, and the only way they were able to get converts to their superstition was to threaten them with either death or torture. They knew nothing whatsoever of geology, and they knew nothing of the other sciences which have opened this whole subject up like a rose and have subjected it into the sunlight of reason and intelligence and the dirty little bugs of religious superstition have vanished as they always do when the sunshine of man's god-given reason shines on them all those superstitionists knew in that day was gods it was an age of gods they knew every god but the real one but as long as the ghastly pall of religious superstition overhung the world, by no possible means could it know everything about God as this spirit actually exists here and now. If a storm raged, destroying villages and homes and human lives, God did it. If a fire was quite naturally kindled in a huge forest, destroying more lives and lots of trees, then God did it, no matter what it might be. If these religious superstitionists did not understand it, they blame it all on God. And never forget here, my friend, that the present system of religion we have with us today, all of them, without exception, were born into existence in this dark age of reasoning. The remnant remaining today is truly just as superstitious in its origin as was the original thing in the dark ages. It cannot be otherwise, for it is part and parcel of that unholy thing, and as such it is inherently the same. True reason and intelligence is demanding and has demanded that they throw away a lot of their dark age teachings, but this does not change the fact that the whole thing originated in and is a direct result of dark age religious superstitious teachings. Don't forget that. Six days. God made the world in six days. He made it in stages of 24 hours each. Think of it. And just because the Bible said so, we have been asked to believe it. This is the Bible story, that is the story of the religious superstitionists. But thank heaven that story is past now, and taking its place, we find science occupying the field. We find reality taking the place of religious superstition. We find facts taking the place of religious superstition. And a great change is coming over the world as this happens. 
It is a universally admitted fact. This dark age story of the creation of the universe is not true. And in a former lesson, I showed you that fact that God being spirit or invisible life could never adopt such methods of making anything. I showed you that the first creation was an invisible creation. And at this point, I shall show you how this invisible creation is absolutely in accord with the very latest scientific findings. And let me add here that there is no religious superstition higher than science, nor is there any religion of any sort higher than science. For science means truth, and truth is higher than any religious superstition, certainly. A scientific fact is a fact that is known to be true. We know it is true. And up against one known scientific fact, you may pile all the religious theories you care to, and they will all be false if they are against that one known proven scientific fact. So let us get along here and see if we can just what is the fact of creation scientifically. And then we see this, we shall see how marvelously it is in accord with what I told you of the creation in a previous lesson. In that lesson, I tackled the problem from the religious angle. Here, I am tackling it from the scientific angle, and we shall soon see there is no clash at all. One truth can never clash with another truth. And we shall perhaps find here in this teaching, before we finish, the startling fact that only truth matters and that all is truth in the final analysis. Perhaps I should not have said that here at this initial stage of our junior together, but I will let it stand as it is. And if some of my students do not understand it, then pass it over for the time being. I know that I have many students who will understand it. I should like to be fair at this point with the religious superstitionists of the dark ages. However, to the extent of admitting they had no way of finding out the truth of creation and its creator. Whatever theory they evolved must have been sheer guesswork. True, they had a book called the Bible, but they had known as much of the origin of the book as we know today. They would have known just exactly what the book was and what it was not. And certainly, they would never have accepted it as being even in the slightest degree divine, for we who have taken the time to investigate know that it is no such thing. It was on the teachings of this superstitious book, however, these old dark age religionists depend for their teachings and their inspiration, and considering that fact, I'm not so sure they are too much to blame for their actions. But their theory of God was, I repeat, entirely guesswork. There were many gods in existence far older than theirs, and the same story they held, too, and told had been told by other supernatural religious superstitionists thousands of years before they had ever lived. I think it, in order to state here that every supernaturally revealed system of religion the world has seen to date, and there have been many of them, have all had the same story to tell in a more or less changed or modified manner. In essence, it is the same thing. I shall not go into detail here, though, as it is aside from the purpose of these lessons, but I mention it in passing to show that even this ghastly dark age religious superstition was only a copy of a far older system and was founded in its entirety on similar stories held many thousands of years before by other supernaturally revealed systems of religion. So once and for all, we can very profitably discard any story in any religion that informs us that it's God made the world in six days, and by the spit and earth method, that is pure guesswork and surmise, and the chances are many to one, it is very untrue. At least we do not believe it today for the simple reason that the facts as we do know them very effectively give the lie to the other story. It is in the realm of fact where we shall find God and nowhere else. Nor will he ever be found in any realm of superstition at all. He will be found, and he has been found in the realm of fact and truth. As these thinkers came into existence, fossil remains were studied. Astronomy was studied, and scientists gradually came to accept the theory that the creation had occupied many billions of years of time. Personally, I, I question the existence of time as we understand it. As their great telescope swept the heavens, they disclosed unmistakable evidence of other planets than ours, sweeping their way with unerring precision and remarkable accuracy through the heavens. They saw these things, and shorn of the old superstition that some supreme being had made all this in a moment of time, they began to look for the scientific explanation of it all. Religion did not and does not answer the question, so they looked to science, 
It has not all happened in a day or a year or anything like that, but it is a well-accepted fact that this world was progressed farther both mentally, intellectually, and spiritually in the past 100 years than it has ever progressed before. More of the truths of God have been learned during the past 25 years than ever learned throughout the entire thousand years of Bacchanalian darkness, during which period the superstitious religionists were at the height of their temporary power and moral degradation, incidentally. Professor Milliken, that giant of the scientific realm and a man to whom I shall again refer in a future lesson, said, Do you realize that within the lifetime of men, now living within 100 years or 130 years at the most, all the material conditions under which man lives his life on this earth have been more completely revolutionized than during all the ages of recorded history which preceded my great-grandfather lived essentially the same sort of life so far as external conditions were concerned as did his Assyrian prototype 6,000 years ago. And Dr. Milliken is quite correct. And at this point, I... Remind my student that the end is not yet even in sight. They are fearless men, men of brilliant intellect, who are tackling this great unseen realm and this great equally seen realm, and we have only just begun to find out something of the magnitude of the mighty laws in existence. Practically every scientific mind today admits that the answer to the problem of the universe and its creator lies in the unseen or spiritual realm. They are recognizing the stupendous fact that unseen forces are responsible for material things. It has taken a long time to arrive at this conclusion, but now that it has been reached, watch the progress from now on. I do not want the religious superstitionists to take any heart from this statement, for I assure them that in the last analysis, and when spiritual truth is known as it really exists, there will be mighty little ground for the superstitious of any field of endeavor to take refuge on. None at all, for all spiritual and all natural law is part of the God law. And no sort of superstition, not even religious, can ever enter that sacred portal of the God realm. Remember that. Away out yonder in space, millions and billions of miles away, are to be seen great nebula. These nebula are vast and immense bodies of cloud-like material, and all of them are quite irregular in form. I've seen many of them through the Great Telescope on Mount Wilson and again in Tucson, Arizona, through the glass of the University of Arizona. Chief among these vast bodies, if we can rightly call them bodies, is the Great Spiral Nebula and the Nebula of Orion. I question very much whether or not the human mind can grasp the enormous distances these cloud-like bodies are from this Earth. The planets are far enough away, and they are much greater density than are these fleecy-looking nebula. One evening I stood at the objective of the great scope on Mount Wilson looking at the planet Uranus. This structure is only about 1,700 million miles away, and yet there I stood looking at it through this wonderful glass, the world's largest. It is accepted that these nebula consist of the substance from which our suns and planets are made, and there are about 250,000 of them which may be seen through the Mount Wilson telescope. These bodies are of immense size, and a nebula only as large as our solar system could not be seen even through the most powerful of all telescopes. Those we do know of are probably thousands of times as large as our entire solar system. The most beautiful of all these known nebula is the one in Orion, and it is perhaps the most beautiful object ever revealed by the telescope. It is more than one million times larger than our entire solar system, the great spiral nebula, we are told represents a mighty sun and a series or a system of planets in the process of formation. In passing, may I mention the fact that our moon is but a dead star. It has no light nor heat on it, nor is there atmosphere either. It is universally admitted among scientists that these nebula are the primary cause of planets, such as the one we live on. Just how this happens is more or less obscure, but is an accepted fact that it has happened and is still happening every day. Some nebula are more dense than others. Some are in the nebulous state, while others shine as suns. It would take far too much time to explain to you the theories given as far as these theories go, while it is a universally accepted fact that planets are th throw-offs from some sun or other, and while it is a further fact that a sun is a completed nebula, we may not know at this time given the exact method by which this remarkable transformation takes place. It is not necessary either we do so, 
if the fact is accepted that these nebula are the cause of suns and other planets, then it is quite sufficient for our purpose here and now. For further study along this line, I recommend a book written by Mr. Marshall Govan entitled The Illustrated Story of Evolution. The book is published and copyrighted by the Peter Eckel Publishing Company of New York City and is one of the best of the condensed works dealing with evolution I have read. Mr. Govan has one little paragraph in that book dealing with this subject of nebula, which I should like to have you read so I reproduce it here and suggest you obtain this book at your earliest convenience. Says Mr. Govan, How is the nebula formed? The cluster in the constellation Hercules, if it is not in fact a colossal nebula, shows that some of these stars are very close together. Now these immense objects that in blind fury dash through space may come in collision with each other and explode in a nebulous cloud, or they may plow through dense swarms of meteorites with the resultant explosion on a smaller scale, or torn by internal convulsions they may burst into fragments and scatter their dead dust over the abyss of space. In one or all of these ways the nebula is born, to begin again the recurring cycle of nature's life. This I think is about the most accepted scientific finding I have run across to date. It explains very simply the process by which these nebula are existent. This is not the important thing however, but it is the exact finding of science along this particular line. You may be sure of one thing, and that is the old globe upon which you and I are living today, at some time or other, must have been part of a nebulous substance floating somewhere in the ether. Its formation probably took millions, if not billions, of years. It was not created in six days. Nor was it created at once and by an act of a personality called God. Such is not the case. For the thing called God by the superstitious does not exist, and what they would like you to term God does exist, but only exists as a God law. And a law has no personality of any sort it cannot have. Neither has it any mind of any sort it cannot have. This God law is infinite. It is omnipotent. It is omniscient. It is all creative. It is impartial. It is not a personality. It is a law. It is more than that. It is the law, if you please. Now mark me carefully, it is the only law there is in the universe. Try and think that out and grasp it well. Perhaps you won't understand that statement to the full now, but you will later on in your studies remember here, though, that there is only one law in the universe, and that is the God law. It is not a personality. It can accomplish anything and everything. It is responsible for every created thing, and there can be no creation of any sort of kind without the operation of this mighty law. It operates in the flight of the nebula, and it operates in and through me as I write this to you, and it operates through you as you read it. It is responsible for yon clusters of stars, and it is responsible for the fish at the bottom of the sea. Had there been no such God law, there would never have been any created thing at all, and it is the same God law operating in and through the intelligence of men that has given the, to the world in the past hundred years the remarkable discoveries that have been made. Now listen to me for a moment, please. If you ever obtain the things you need in life, those things will be brought to you into being through the operations of this mighty God law. This law you are learning about now will be the means of bringing it to you, either health, wealth, happiness, peace, or whatever it is you need. And these things can come no other way. I have a very specific reason for desiring that you learn well the picture as this lesson has given it to you. Forget about any personality of any sort being responsible for this universe and for you. Realize here that a great creative God law is alone responsible. Try and imagine the vastness of space and try to imagine that the creative process, which have brought man to this present state of development, have been going on for millions of years. Learn the fact of the great ethereal bodies called nebula floating around in the ether, for ether pervades all space. I shall have a very startling statement to make regarding this in the next lesson, but realize that a mighty creative God law is the controlling factor and sole and supreme creative power. I shall not take you any farther into the subject in this lesson, for I want you to grasp carefully everything I say to you now. Remember that God is invisible life. Remember, too, that a thought is an invisible thing. Remember also that your thoughts are part of the great invisible life principle responsible for everything, especially life itself. 
for where life is. The other things can always be, but where life is not, then nothing else can be. I want to get the thought home to you that you are a living, vital manifestation of the most powerful law in the world. I want you to see that you are a vital part and a manifestation of the only law there is in the world. And I want you to grasp the fact that you, through the part of you called your thoughts, are in direct contact with this mighty God law, which can produce everything, including whatsoever things you need here and now on earth. If you do not receive these things, it is your fault. It is because you have not grasped the law or perhaps have not had it pointed out to you. Away back yonder, back of the nebula, back of all the planets, back of every created thing, you will remember that this mighty life spirit made an invisible creation. No other kind I shall show you from now on exactly how this mighty God spirit brought into physical manifestation the creation that he had already made. Then I shall show you how you, by pursuing the same methods this God law provides for, will bring into actual manifestation the things you need. For certainly the law is here. Certainly it operates. If it could take a spiritual nebula and from it make a marvelous creation such as we now enjoy, then do you not think it can create for the few paltry things that you need? Of course it can, for it is the God law, the very same principle that brought every manifested thing to earth. It is a law and don't you forget it. You are doing the little exercises I have prescribed for you. I shall impress on you once more the absolute importance of setting before your mind as we say the thing you want. I don't care what it is. The probability though is that is either business success, health or happiness. And let me assure you that this great God law can bring them all to you when you learn how to comply with the conditions governing it in your own life. But making sure of what it is you want and then let every thought when not occupied be of that thing. If it is success, then be intent in your little affirmation and say, I am more and more successful. I am more and more successful. Let this sentence eat into you. Let it become a very part of you. After a while, you will be doing it unconsciously. And when that time comes, you will be well on the way to actual manifestation of this very thing. Throughout the spinal column and brain, there runs a fluid called the spinal fluid. This is composed of what are called neurons, and these neurons join hands with each other, as it were. The end of one grasps the end of the other. Every thought going through your cerebrospinal system or the sympathetic nervous system makes a definite movement along these neurons. It makes a path. Which path, however, comes up the minute the thought has passed? This is a physiological fact now. You let the same thought be repeated over and over and over again. There is made a definite path or channel in these neurons, which belongs peculiarly to that one thought. With repeated affirmations or repetitions of that one thought or statement, they become automatic, so to speak, and they become a very part of you. I only mention this to show you that there is a scientific reason for everything I ask you to do. And greater than that, there stands behind it all the God law. And certainly that cannot be held incompetent to produce whatever is needed. So let this statement of your success ever be uppermost in your mind. Remember, you really want success to come to you. You are not indifferent at all, but you actually want it. And in order that it may come, you are willing to work a little bit mentally for it, for this is what it amounts to. You do not know at this point the mighty God law by which these needed things will come, but you are willing to work intelligently with me in order that the God law about which practically nothing is known can manifest. Perhaps your trouble is one of health. In this case, you shall use the statement to the exclusion of all other statements and thoughts. The living God is making me whole. The living God is making me whole. Do not feel that there is anything even faintly connected with this superstitious religion about this statement, for there is not. Psychiana is a new psychological religion and therefore it is a scientific religion, not a superstitious one. And the founder of this system and your present teacher knows whereof he speaks. He knows the God law exists. No matter what the illness or the sickness may be, use that statement. Use it. Drive it into your very being. You will be putting the God law into play if you will. If it is happiness you need, 
then say, I am happier, happier and happier, and keep at it. At night, you're still relaxing. You're lying very still. You finally forget that you have a body and you feel slowly the sleep creeping up on you. Then you focus your thoughts and your desire into your very ego, for that is what the white spot is a manifestation of, and you are asleep. When you awake, the very first thing that you do, go into your statement, no matter which of these it may be, and you mean it. It is becoming a very active part of you, and you mean business. You want to actually find the God as the mighty power exists, and you will if you follow me. In the next lesson, I shall go into this same subject a little further and will deal with the actual existence of this God law throughout all space. I will show you what it is, and then a little later how it operates. Strangely as it may seem, you and I live and move and have our being in the very midst of the most potent dynamic power we have ever seen or heard of. And yet we wander around looking for something or other to bring us the good things of life. The next lesson will show you the actual existence of the God principle, and I do not think such a lesson has ever been written before. I do not think any of the scientists have seen it. Perhaps they have, but if they have, I have never heard of it being called to anyone's attention before. Don't forget to write me if you experience any difficulty in grasping these lessons. I want to help you find God, the real God, not a personality of any sort, but the greatest creating power in existence points to remember in lesson six one what was accepted as the truth a few hundred years ago is not accepted as the truth today two the immense truth of the unseen spiritual law as you are learning it in these lessons has always existed but has not been recognized until quite recently three the only limitations there need be on your life are the limitations you put there yourself for truth is all powerful and when the truth of the spiritual realm is applied in your life this truth will enable you to do almost everything you want to do four the applications of the god law in your life will be followed by material manifestations also five if you're not well physically repeat the affirmation given in this lessons continually until it becomes part of your very nature six grasp this lesson fully before you receive the next one for in that lesson you'll be given another forward glance into the great spiritual realm of truth be sure and write me if you do not understand anything in this lesson and i will try to help you with it sincerely your friend frank robinson as we can see in lesson six frank robinson really emphasizes the importance of scientific truth and saying that it can be used to verify the god law this is important Many people will hear this lesson and get the idea that God is not a personality and be turned away by it. But that is coming from a misconception that you were given. In no way does the Bible imply that it's a personality either. One of the things to remember is that there are truths in the Bible. When we treat it as a historical document talking about scientific truth, then it's wrong. As we've learned from Neville Goddard, it is symbolic and it does describe the God law, but only when you have read it and then go to the next level and understand the symbology of it. God does create a personality in his creation, but is not a personality himself. There is one unifying force that has created the universe and we're slowly understanding it. And that is why this teaching is so powerful because he's coming at it from the point of scientific truth trying to eliminate superstition and even then there is a powerful way of utilizing this law to manifest reality so now that we've come to this point there's been some pretty good affirmations that you can use he's emphasized the importance of doing this while you go to sleep forgetting about your body and you can say i am more and more successful i am more and more successful or you can say i am more and more rich i am more and more rich i am more and more wealthy the living god is making me whole the living god is making me whole these are things that really work i am happier and ha happier and i'm happier all of these things really work and it is based on a god law so each lesson slowly unveils like an onion 
what the God law is. That is why the Psychiana lessons are powerful. You may not agree with some of the things he says, and there is still power in reading the Bible and many of the lessons that we've been given, but he's emphasizing the superstitious part of it to eliminate. Think scientifically about your spirituality. There is a science to this, and if we take the scientific view, there are real truths within the spiritual lessons that we've been given through our whole lives. In any case, please put in the comments how the first five lessons and now the sixth lesson have gone for you. Have you tried these affirmations? Has this unveiled any understandings of the God law for you? I would love to know how it's been going for you. And eventually we will create a sleep meditation around these wonderful affirmations. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.